Hi. Nice to have you here. Yeah. Um, you're an expert in uh, IPFix. Can you tell us a bit about your background in IPFix? Well, it started um, probably in 2005. How, how, how much detail should I go into here? I can go into enormous amounts of detail. Wow. Um, it's up so, to you. Um, so basically, I'd been working on um, flow collection systems for a while. Uh, we were using primarily NetFlow, V5, V9, and a few um, uh, sort of proprietary collectors and proprietary formats. And um, I was at the IETF looking at um, uh, instant data sharing for security stuff sort of on the side, and I decided to stop by the IPFIX working group. Uh, I guess this would have been in Paris back in, in 2005. So around about the time that they were, there, was a, there was the first interop, they were originally sort of thinking, okay, we're done, let's wrap this up. Um, and I was really thinking about, okay, well, as somebody who, who deals with flow data collection, with flow data analysis, you know, what are the aspects of this protocol? You know, what, what does this look like from my standpoint? And, and um, I think, you know, sort of found a, a few things that, oh, well, maybe I would change this, maybe I would change that, and it started making a little bit of noise on the, on the uh, list and in the meetings. And, um, but, but basically, your interest was security? My interest was, yeah, was flow measurement for security. Okay. Um, so, and there you have a very different... Um, a very different sort of set of requirements that you do when you're doing performance things. So I think a lot of the activity at that time was in PSAMP. Yeah. So in terms of like looking about sampling the packets and then saying, okay, well, well, we'll use IPFIX to export this. We're, we're looking primarily for, um, for sort of QoS applications. Um, whereas at the time I was more interested in sort of the reliability of flows and being able to match things directly. Um, so the first, real, um, the first real document that I worked on was with Elisa Bosky. Um, then at either Fraunhofer or Hitachi, I'm not sure which, and we did uh, Biflow, so that became RFC 5103. And then, you know, as I got a little bit more involved, I kind of got more and more and more involved on, in IP fix and sort of got my hands on a little bit on everything. So um, I think, yeah, maybe I annoyed some of the old timers by showing up and saying, no, we should do this and we should do this and we should do this. I know Dave Plonka was, was hoping to close the working group around that time because the idea was, okay, we got the export done, the collecting process looks good enough, we're done. And um, yeah, I, I guess I had different ideas. You are still quite, say, active in uh, yep. IPFIX. Are there specific things in IPFIX and RFCs where you're not involved in? Um, I'm not really involved at all on the MIB side of things. So the, the, the management of the devices themselves, I think um, there's, IPFIX itself is a little bit too flexible to really standardize the configuration of how the metering processes specifically work um, at anything other than the lowest common denominator. So the, the, the configuration work that I think Gerhard Munz did, that's very good work, uh, but it was just sort of away from, you know, I want to push things into, into sort of new information elements and new applications, and, and that work is focused primarily on sort of configuring the, you know, the common use cases of you have a, you know, a forwarding device or a measurement device, a, a dedicated device there. So, and then the MIB stuff, I could never really get, I could never really get, comfortable with SNMP. Okay. That's nice to hear because yeah. we had many people who talked about SNMP. So yes. It's good to have someone. Well, it's very, it's, it's very, it's all over the place in sort of the network operations community. And I came, you know, long, long ago, I came, I started as a sysadmin, um, which I guess is, is a rather uncommon um, beginning of a career arc for a researcher. But, um, and I remember doing some, you know, some monitoring and measurement on our relatively small site. We had 60, 70 machines, 400 users. Uh, this is at Georgia Tech. And, you know, everyone's like, SNMP this, SNMP that. And I was like, okay, well, okay, now you install Tickle, and then you get this stack up, and then you have to, and it was, yeah, I just ended up writing something in Perl, right? So, and I think a lot of people at that level ended up doing that, and I never really got over my, my distaste for SNMP, I think. Okay. Um, IPFIX is based on, say, NetFlow. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the relationship between NetFlow and IPFIX? Um, this is a really, um, I'm going to answer that as a terminological question. Um, IPFIX has a meaning and NetFlow has many meanings. Um, so, you know, NetFlow is a product of Cisco and it's also an exporting, it's a, it's a particular metering process that Cisco has or a particular set of metering processes and a particular set of exporting processes and then sort of a whole ecology of collectors which are, are more or less compatible and then exporting processes which are sort of the same thing which are more or less compatible. Um, Whereas IPFIX is, at least as I see it, 
it's really about the protocol. We don't really go too far into the metering process. We don't. We try to stay away from too far or too far on the other side of the collecting process. You know, obviously, we had to define how mediators work because there are sort of protocol level things there. But it's really about the protocol, the information model, and the data format. Um, yeah. Whereas NetFlow is is yeah, it's sort of all these things mixed together. I think. Mm -hmm. um, you've. You, you have a lot of experience on implementing mm -hmm. IPFix. What are the parts of IPFix where you think that's easy to implement and which are the parts that are really hard to implement? Well, the problem with me answering this question right now is that's how I learn new languages. It's like, oh, I need to learn a new language. I'll write IPFix in it and see, you know, mm -hmm. actually how I just did this uh, about a month ago with Python. So the, the IPFix Python module is, uh, is me learning Python. So I apologize to anyone who's using it and it doesn't look like I know what I'm doing in Python because I didn't when I started. Um, the things that I dislike having to implement the most are really the corner cases. So, um, and this is something that we tried to fix in RFC 5101 BIS. Can you give examples of such corner um, cases? What happens with, with templates when you expire them and then reuse the IDs? Uh, I, I, I'll admit to in my own work just sort of leaving that part of the specification out in many cases because I don't need to do it, right? I think if you've gotten to the point where you have that many templates that they have and they have very dynamic lifetimes, you've done something wrong with your information model design. Um, the other thing that can be a little bit annoying to get right, and so that the thing that I always, the thing that every time I've implemented it, there's been a bug and then I've had to go track it down is the variable length information element encoding. That, that mm -hmm. always... You know, it's a little bit twee. It's like it's like a Pascal string, but not really. And you have to be very careful about making sure you keep your offsets correct in order to get it to work. And I still get that wrong. So, for what kind of purposes do you use this? Uh, so the varlin encoding is yeah. for strings. Yes. But so is it for URL uh, detection? In, that kind of stuff. In the cases that I've implemented it in, it's primarily so that I can have an underlying library that can read and write strings. Mm -hmm. um, I, so the, the work I'm doing now is in sort of passive TCP uh, performance measurement, and there everything is fixed length, so it made it very, but I figured if I'm going to write the, if I'm going to put out a Python module, it might as well be able to do what the spec says it should do. Um, so that's really the, that's really my impetus for doing it. I've never had much use in my own work uh, for uh, variable length information elements and for string, string data. I know there was uh, a while ago when I was actually involved in writing the specification for um, SIP CLF. And with SIP CLF, there all of the all of the information elements came from SIP, and all of that is is delimited strings. So so there we defined a lot of, of variable length information elements. But in the main in the IANA um, registry, there's only a few. So SSID and interface name and things like this. Are there specific things that you miss in IPFix that you would like to have it added? Who? Um, I'm going to answer no, <laughs> because if you start pulling on it, then you 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 kind of you, you have a scope problem, right? So what what I like about IPFix as a protocol and a data format is it's very very good for concisely representing and exporting data that is. Uh, very semantically similar, right? So I have hundreds of thousands or millions of records and they all look the same. And I can export that efficiently. I know what it means. I can stick it on disk somewhere and then forget about it. And then um, come back years later and the information elements are still there, right? Uh, and it doesn't have sort of all of the, all of sort of the baggage of XML or, or uh, the ASCII encoding problems you'd have with JSON. Um, so I mean, there's there's some work to sort of make IPFix more capable, but I think in a lot of cases, if you really have a whole lot more structure, um, you should be using something else, maybe. So basically, you're saying you don't expect major changes in IPFix anymore. Um, I would be okay without major changes in IPFix anymore. It's it's I'm there are other people in the working group. <laughs> So it's more but, focusing now on deployment. Uh, it's focusing now on deployment and um, and applications. So so bringing bringing IP fix into new areas, um, both in network management and sort of outside of network management. You work at a university, you have a lot of experience on implementing mm -hmm. uh, IP fix. If uh, students would like to experiment with it and they 
are looking for open source. What kind of open source tools would you recommend them to start playing with? Well, obviously, I'd recommend my own because when something breaks, then I can I can uh, figure out uh, what went wrong. Um, so there's uh, for the flow metering side, there are both YAF and QAF. YAF is, is I think, relatively well known. I did the original implementation of that years ago when I was at CERT and SA. Uh, but that's, that, that tool has, has evolved significantly uh, since I left, so I think it's mainly the work of, of the team there. Um, uh, I'm working on a fork of that now with it doesn't have the DPI features in it, but does have um, uh, the TCP performance stuff that I'm experimenting with. Um, for the analysis side of things, uh, Silk is very, very good for basic uh, flow analysis. Um, and both of these, both sort of the YAF Silk toolchain, have the advantage of they are used in production. So when something breaks, it's probably the code that you added, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to sort of you know taking research code uh, code off the off the shelf and trying to extend it. You mentioned deep packet inspection. Yes, and um, that triggers me to what is currently. The whole debate that is uh, the prism and this yes. kind of stuff. Aren't you afraid that technologies like IPFIX uh, are being used to monitor, say, end users uh, and that there are privacy concerns? Well, there are absolutely privacy concerns. So, I mean, the first thing I did when I started um, uh, working on flow exporters, uh, again, was I took a flow exporter that did DPI off the shelf and ripped all of the DPI out. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, the privacy concerns, and two, I don't think it's that useful. Uh, we're seeing more and more and more traffic being encrypted uh, at the transport layer. So if you're relying on being able to look at packets, uh, inside the packets, and understand the semantics of the payload, um, either for security purposes or for performance purposes, you're, you're going to need another plan in the next five years. So I think that, that, that DPI is kind of dead. Um, that having been said, the metadata side of things, so with respect to PRISM, you don't really need DPI to be able to make very, very deep, um, very, very deep inferences about who's talking to whom and, and what sort of their, their connections in the real world are. Um, and yes, obviously, I mean, the tools can be, you know, the tools are used by the people who use the tools. Um, I try for myself not to, you know, work on single-use technologies where the only use is spying on your citizenry. Um, but, you know, the, the, the tools themselves are not good or evil. Okay. It's what the people do with the it's tools. It's what people do with the tools, right? And with, when you have a protocol like IPFIX, you can, you can absolutely, you know, it's like, here's a new information element, and uh, I want to set the terrorist bit on this flow. Um, you can certainly do that. We probably would not take it into the IANA registry, but it's, it's just a data format. Okay. What are your plans on IPFIX in, say, the next year, next two years? Um, so I'm doing a lot of work in passive performance measurement. That's sort of my, my, um, my big thing these days. Uh, and I'd like to see a little bit of standardization there in terms of so passive TCP monitoring for latency, loss, so on and so forth, which raises an, a really interesting question about how deeply defined the information element should be. So if I measure RTT using one algorithm and someone else uses uh, another algorithm to measure RTT, are those the same information element because we're trying to measure the same thing? Or are those different information elements um, because there are different implementations behind them? And these are, these are sort of questions that, that I uh, am talking a lot with people about take, these days. Take the example of RTT measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that you need to standardize the way how you uh, measure it or not? I, I don't think you should standardize the way that you measure it because there are a whole bunch of different techniques on the passive side and each of them has a, a specific applicability to a specific um, arrangement of observation point uh, or to sort of a specific um, you know, application. What do you want the information for? Um, there are things that you can do on one way uh, uh, flows which, so where you only have one side of the flow. Uh, there are things where you need to see both sides. Both of them have inaccuracies and corner cases that you have to correct for. Um, I, I'm leaning in that case toward sort of defining information elements that, that say this is the parameter that we're trying to measure. And if there's any additional information that you need to put into the flow record or alongside the flow record about the algorithm that was used, then you can attach that using options templates. So if you go really, really far down that path, then it may make sense to have standardized registries of algorithm names 
so that at least somebody who comes and picks up the data or picks up data from many, many sources um, has some information about the biases that came into that from each implementation and can then do a better interpretation of that after the fact. Um, okay. Um, are there more things you would like to say? Or? No. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you for the interview. And oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much for, for inviting me. This was interesting. Thank you. Yeah, have a good day. Yep.